don't know how we can talk about all this without letting our Lord have the last word. That's where we are now. All my life, I've heard older brothers giving advice to younger 80 brothers. Say, if you want, if you have a problem, and you have to make a judgment, uh, you need to open your Bible and find the answer. Anyone ever heard that before? I think so. The answers are in the Bible, and yet, in 2,000 times, there were no, there were no denominations in the times of Paul. There were just the Judaizers, the men in Jerusalem, and the men in Antioch. And then there was the great world at large, the Romans and the Hebrews. So he had to say something that would deal with the conditions of those times. He said enough. He certainly said enough for us to follow the gospel and get to know Christ um, on a conceptual level. But he didn't address some of the particulars that we have to deal with in our efforts to reconcile. Or did he? So that's the question. And if we go to God's word advice, for advice, what, what advice um, are we seeking? Well, in matters of reconciliation, it isn't sufficient for us with the problem at hand to know that we are in the ministry of reconciliation. But, you know, but it doesn't give us the mechanics of what we are trying to do. In the situation between Jerusalem and Antioch, which we don't have time to speak about today, they resolve that problem by following a certain set of steps that were recommended ultimately by James, uh, made a deference to the weaker brethren, interestingly enough, in Jerusalem, observing things that were no longer necessary to observe, but that would resolve their, their problem. They all agreed on it and went on with life. Um, and it wasn't any time after that that the Jerusalem Ecclesia was destroyed in the destruction of Jerusalem. So that put an end to that issue. By the time we get to Jesus giving his message to the seven churches in Revelation, uh, Christianity had moved from its origin, point of origin, to um, the, the, the region up around uh, Turkey, what is now Turkey today. So um, there was no issue between Judaizers and, uh, and uh, brethren who understood, uh, who were from the Gentile world who had now established Christ. So, what I would like to do now in the last portion, I would like for you to be patient with me because um, this is very difficult. It's difficult because I have four sections in this and I could spend the entire time on each one. I nevertheless decided to bring it up anyway, even though we, have to, we will be insufficient in looking at these, these four conditions in, in the Bible because at least I will have introduced you to them you can pick up where we may have to leave off in our brevity and work with them as you go. Uh, I think they are definitely worth considering because the premise here is if you want to know how to reconcile, you can find out what steps to take in scriptural reconciliations. We're going to be looking at four considerations in scripture that apply the mechanics of spiritual reconciliation. Uh, one is with a brother. A brother who needed to reconcile with his brothers. One is with a, a priest who needed to reconcile in his congregation. One is with a king who needed to reconcile with the people in his kingdom. And then the last one that we will consider is a prophecy relating to the king of the world when he comes and begins the process of reconciliation through the formation of his priesthood in a judgment that has specific parameters to it. So we're looking at reconciliations from the standpoint of a brother, of a priest, of a king, and finally, the king of this world. It's extremely difficult for me, but it may help because I'm emotional about these scriptures. Part of the reason is so is everyone else, especially Joseph's reconciliation. Please look at Genesis 45. Six. This is the end of the story. 
Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers. He has wept on Benjamin's neck, and Benjamin has wept on his neck. In verse 3, he says, I am Joseph. He still didn't know they were telling the truth. No. Is my father still alive? And they had told him many times that he was. He still has an issue of trust with them. But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed. And they realized who this was and what power he had over them. And Joseph, essentially, might have what they had done. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Well, almost as if to say, be carefully. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And then he says, it's so astonishing. You know, I remember reading in Ways of Providence or something like 40 years ago or so. Robert Roberts said, this would break down the strongest of men, the story. And it's drama in, in Joseph revealing to his brother and all the things that were involved. Here, but in the midst of this recognition, now they realize he understands he has power over them. He doesn't know if they're telling the truth. He's starting to believe that his father is still alive. He's proven that Benjamin is still alive. But now, in the midst of all of this, look at where his heart is. This is the heart of reconciliation. But now, do not therefore be greedy or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. How could he say that? Well, God sent him before you to preserve life. That's the bigger picture. So Joseph now is looking at the bigger picture, and that enables him to manage the, the, the small picture of this incredible tension that would otherwise exist on a natural level. These brothers that tried to destroy him and uh, did so unsuccessfully. Joseph knew all this was true because of the dream. God sent me before you to preserve life. If you really think about the impact of that statement, we will understand the purpose of reconciliation and its consideration. So in one sense, we've spoken already about the importance of reconciliation, where people in the world are looking at us and our testimony in light of the work that we have to do with the gospel message. It's very important to all of us, more important, Christ, and also important to those who are to be saved, or now in But there's another element involved. Life was Joseph thinking of that he could preserve. He was thinking of the children. So there's another object to reconciliation, and that is God we see. The effect that disparity and the effect that reconciliation has on our children. I be personally believe that we cannot let it go another generation. Not that we have that time in light of the second coming of Christ, but it should be our objective in light of this principle. So the preservation of life is such a powerful concept that we've actually brought that into our arranging for Let me just say this as an aside. We have questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, just like all of you do. We have questions about people who find themselves in immoral situations. We have, and these are questions of, of judgment. You know how in, 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 in the legal issues there are either offenses or judgments. And when there are offenses, there are usually judgments that have to be made. So we decided upon the basis of this story and, upon, and, and on the basis of its effect on our understanding of reconciliation, motivating us to move into the central fellowship, that when things came up internally as matters that we had to make judgments on the arranging board, that the first question we would ask when a question comes up is, how can we preserve life with our judgment? So there's a couple. They shouldn't be married to each other. They're sorry. They ask to come back. We start with this question, how can we preserve life? It may or may not affect the particulars of that 
situation, but when it does, it gives us a light in the distance to follow that guiding light, which is a dim glimmer in the distance of a dark situation. So what I would like to do for you now is just recount what happened with Joseph and his brothers. You know, you know he was thrown in the pit, you know he was saved in Egypt, you know it was 13 years um, between the time he arrived and the time that he took uh, control as Lord of Egypt. He even said that uh, I'm a father to Pharaoh, which tells me, it may indicate to me that Pharaoh was considerably younger than Joseph. And um, I don't know the facts around that, I'm just guessing because he said I'm a father to Pharaoh, but it's interesting think of the position that God put him in. All this related to dreams he had when he was a little boy that became the source of his brother's jealousy over him. But then, what happened in, in this story, go back to, to Genesis 42. I'm not going to read these verses too much, but I, I just want to kind of like get a gist of the story so that we can see what Joseph did to reconcile. There's a famine in the land, and Jacob says to his sons, why are you sitting around looking at each other? Go down to Egypt and get some food. They go to Egypt, they arrive, and as soon as they arrive, Joseph is in control. It's his idea to save the food in the first place. He knows the length of the famine from his dreams, and he's got food enough for, for all his purposes in Egypt, and even for God's purposes, and he knows he's aware of those purposes. The brothers don't, don't see him. I, I suppose Joseph may have had some kind of Egyptian makeup around his eyes and all shaven and probably didn't look anything like what he might have looked like had he grown with his brothers at home. But they come, and as soon as he sees them, he recognizes them. The ten brothers have come down there, and, and they say, we have come to get prayer. And he said, who are you? He knows who they are. So he said, well, we're, we're a member of a family back here, and uh, our dad's back there, and there's Benjamin, and we have another brother. We have actually two brothers. There's ten of us and two others. And we left the, the other home. One is no more. Imagine what happened to Joseph's heart when they said that. One is no more. And they're talking to him. He said, but there's another at home. My father wouldn't let him come. But should anything befall him, it would, it, it, it would take our father down to his grave and sorrow. So all this was, was true. And Joseph says to them, they said, we know we're honest men. And that was a lie, because they were not honest men. They had lied to their father about Joseph. So can you imagine how Joseph felt when they said, oh, we're honest men? And he said, you are spies. Come see the nakedness of the land. They go, no, no, we're, we're honest men. And, and they felt themselves in a rather strange position, because they came from food, and now they're being interrogated by an authority that could incarcerate them. It's almost like they'd gone past customs and they were in his control and they knew it. So it was a, a, a worrisome affair and they they said, well, well, we came to get food. And he said, you are spies. You are lying to me. I know what I'll do. I will test to see if you are telling the truth. You mentioned to me that you have me and my brother. I'm going to put you all in, in, in jail and I'm going to send one of you back. And if he can come to get your brother and bring him, then I will know that you are telling the truth. But if not, I'll know you are liars, and I will have you here in jail. So he, he puts them all in prison, and, and, they, and they explain to him, well, well, wait a minute, you can't do that, because our father was afraid to send us down here in the first place with him. We can't go and get him like that and bring him down here. Uh, so he said, oh, then I will do it another way. He kind of understood what they were saying. He said, oh, well, we'll put one of you, put Cindy in jail. And I will send the rest of you back. Go get your brother and bring him back here. And you will not see Simeon again unless you bring the other brother back. So I, my, my sense is that Joseph didn't trust them. There's an absence of trust. This was a component of their reconciliation. It became a basis of everything that followed. He had to establish trust. And he did, did certain deliberate things in order to do this. So he, he sends them on their way. He puts Simeon in, in, in jail. And he sends the brothers back home. But he has his servant put all their money, return all their money, because he loves them. He already knows that this is of God. But he doesn't know if he can trust them. He doesn't know if he's telling the truth. He doesn't even know if Benjamin or his father is alive. He wants to be sure they haven't done the same thing. At least this is my take on it. That they haven't done the same thing to Benjamin out of jealousy that he knew they did to him. He's very concerned about Benjamin. Benjamin follows his thoughts throughout this whole process. So there's a life that he wants to establish as having been saved. He's very sensitive to the saving of life. 
So they go back home, they, 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 and on the way they discovered that the money was there, that they, they were shocked and horrified because they thought, it, he's going to think we're thieves, he's going to think we stole, we don't even know how this happened, we're gonna, and he knew he was putting them in our deal. Uh, but he didn't mind putting his brothers in an ordeal in order to reconcile with them. It was part of what was necessary, this testing process, to bring them into a point where he could establish repentance in them. He could then use that repentance as a basis of trust. And on that basis of trust, he could follow through with God's intent to preserve life through the, the, the reunion that Joseph would experience with his brothers. So they get hungry again, Joseph's, uh, Jacob says, go down and get some more food. And they said, we can't go back. He's, he's got Simeon in prison. And if we go back, uh, we have to take Benjamin. If we don't take Benjamin, it's going to put us all in jail. We'll never see any of us again. And Jacob is saying, well, if I give Benjamin to you, and some evil that falls him on the way, uh, I will have lost both my sons. I can't do this. There's no, how do you even ask me? And why did you tell him about Benjamin in the first place? And they're saying, well, how could we help him? He was questioning us. He had power over us. There was nothing we could do. And so this, is, this is whole incredible, dramatic situation is going that is, is getting more and more possible with every path. And what they don't know is something that Joseph knew. They were two years in on a seven-year famine. So they would die in Israel of starvation if they didn't resolve this problem. So they talked their father into sending Benjamin back. They did it very reluctantly, but finally gave in because when you are hungry, you will do anything. They went back. As soon as Joseph saw Benjamin, he recognized him. He went home. Wherever it was that they were distributing grain, Joseph said to his servant, I'm ready to bring my home. So he said to the servant, you know, like, we, had, we brought double the money back, we brought these gifts, um, we give you everything, we're not dishonest men. And the servant said, I could have made that. I gave you that shirt. The servant had, had the same spirit as Joseph. It, it appears to me that the ser Joseph's servant really understood what was happening here. If not, he's an extraordinary person because he comforts Joseph's brothers. He says, I gave you treasure. So come to my master's house. He brings them home. He releases Simeon. And it appears that he washes their feet. Where do you think Jesus got the idea to wash his disciples' feet? And he got it from this occurrence in the reconciliation of Joseph with his brothers. I know Jesus saw himself and his disciples and his relationship with Israel as being back into the same as his, as his embodied metaphorically in Joseph's reconciliation with his brothers. There's a lot of depth in this story. So Joseph sets a table for them, and on that table he sets bread and wine. They had not yet reached a point of repentance and confession. Joseph knew that they were going there because now he knew that Benjamin was alive. That means that what happened to him was unique. He had established that in his own understanding and also was ready to work with them. So when they come into his room, he sees Benjamin, he could not contain himself. He leaves and he leaves and he comes back and then he reveals himself to his brothers. But in the course of all this, what happened was he tested them in order to establish trust. Their feet were washed. He prepared a table for them before they were ready to reconcile with him, before they had even repented. He put bread and wine on his table. And when, when, as the events turned out, he sent them away again. Um, or like the second second before this, he sent them away. They put the silver cup in, in, in Benjamin's bag as they were going. Um, he sent his servant after them to say, go get the cup and tell them, ask them why they've done this evil thing. They take it, they, they go one by one from Reuben all the way down the line to Benjamin. When they see that Benjamin appears to have stolen Joseph's cup, there's this empty silver cup in a bag of grain. They went into a pain. So the servant says, why have you done this evil thing? They bring him back to Joseph, and it was at that point that Joseph just can't bear it anymore because at that point also they made a confession. They said, the Lord has brought this, this evil upon us. We are innocent, but this is because of what we, we have done, the iniquity that we did to our brother. And when they started confessing, Joseph knew 
that he's had in his life where they need to be. He falls off a bench in his shoulder. And he says, this is after he had set the table for me. He falls on bench in his shoulder and he says, I'm Joseph, my brother. They couldn't believe it. But then he says, the Lord did this for us. The Lord made this happen so that he could preserve life. I will provide for you. Go and get my father and bring him here. He told Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, this is really good. Let's bring him here and I will give him a place in the best of the land for the rescue of his history. So let's take a look at what Joseph did for us to reconcile. The first thing he did was test his brethren in an environment of distrust. Is there anything we can learn? He sought trust with them as well as repentance. Before they had repented, he prepared a table for them. They communed at the door of his house. And what's significant about that is the door of Joseph's house, the same thing as the gate of the temple. The door of the temple that Jesus said, when it's shut, no man can open. When it's open, no man can shut. He does this. This door is the ingress and the egress, in, in and out of the temple of God. This door is where fellowship practice is established. They communed at the door of his house. He effected peace and washed their feet. They offered a gift at his table. He prepared bread and wine for his brethren. This goodness induced confession cut the heart and induced confession and repentance. And God's purpose was acknowledged, and when it was acknowledged, acknowledged they were provided for and nourished. So the order of this is significant. The first thing he did was prove them. Then he prepared them. Joseph was doing this to save his brethren and their progeny. He effected peace with them and reassured them. And then there was penitence. So let me make it clear to you that in this view, this is a short view of something that I would take a lot more time to elaborate if you go point by point through the whole story. But in the short view in this list, I don't mean to say that therefore this is exactly what we should do in order to resolve our problem. That's not the way a principle works. A principle has an intrinsic idea that is more or less applicable depending on how we understand it to be applicable. That's all I'm doing is presenting this to you as something the Bible provides for us in our understanding that is the basis of how this reconciliation took place. There are others and they will make different points. Our role in this understanding then is to say, well, what, how will we think about this? I'm offering this to you, not as the method, but as a consideration that will lead us to the method. Let's then look at what happened as a result of Joseph's decision. Life was preserved. Preserved for 400 years, and then they came back to the promised land, and it was preserved to the priesthood, to the kingdom. Uh, it was preserved enough to create a basis for God to bring his son into this world through uh, generations of, of people converging the priesthood and the kingship in that in the life of that son. It was preserved in the law, wasn't it? Because if Joseph hadn't saved his brothers, there would have been no Israel. There would have been no law. So Joseph's decision extended beyond the immediate situation, the salvation of the family, to the salvation of the Jews in Egypt from famine. But beyond that, it resulted in the formation of God's law when they were the congregation was then in the wilderness and life was preserved. Joseph, I don't think, saw all the orders of consequence that would follow the mercy that arose in his heart toward his brethren. If he had not been merciful, they wouldn't have been saved. So this thing whole, the whole thing was dependent upon mercy. Then beyond that, life was preserved in Christ because Joseph's uh, decision enabled um, 
progeny to, to, to continue right up until Jesus was born from Mary, who had his lineage going back to Abraham. And life then was preserved to that point. But beyond that, life has been preserved even to now. Where would we be if there had been no Christ because there was no Israel, because there were no 12 sons of Jacob, because Joseph had not had mercy on his brothers? Where would we be? Joseph had no idea where his decision would go. But that one decision, that heart that had mercy on brethren who were only caught, was so important to the plan of God that out of it has come all of our salvation. Joseph's mercy. And then the mercy of Christ. And all that is called, even until the end. The second real reconciliation is with the priest at the altar of Gilead. Turn to Joshua 23. The story is there. Genesis 22. Joshua 22, verse 34. What does verse 34 say? Again, we begin with the conclusion of the matter because the conclusion of the matter is the effect of reconciliation. There had been a disparity because their brethren were separated from them, in this case by the Jordan River. Or on the other side of the Jordan, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh had inherited land that was on the other side of the Jordan, not along with all the other tribes that were on uh, the eastern side of the Jordan. But once it was all said and done, this disparity and the misunderstanding that they had and the manner in which they reconciled, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called this altar witness. For it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Here was Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And they recognized, they meant for this altar to mean that they were one with their brethren. Very important story. So how does it begin? It begins back when Joshua was, was distributing the tribes to their allocations in the land. And he said, your portion is on the other side of the Jordan. He said this to the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, half the tribe of Manasseh. Your portion is on the other tribe, side of the Jordan. But be careful. You're going to be separated from us. And when you're separated, be careful to do all that the Lord has commanded you and to not forget who you are. So they listened to Joshua. And they, they, they took heed to that. But then someone said, they built an altar. They're starting to worship with the sons of Edom. They've left the truth. They don't believe the same things we do anymore. They've got an, an altar to a strange God. We need to do something about this. But Phineas gets involved. You remember who Phineas was? He was the one that was in the matter of Peor, where, where they were two in the temple, Crosby and Zimri, who were defiling the temple. There were 26,000 others who died, and Phineas was the one who had to make a judgment. As a result of that judgment, God made an everlasting covenant with life and peace with him. So it was such was the function of this high priest at the time. The whole congregation of Israel, if you look at this, I want you to look at the chapter here. Verse 12, it speaks about the whole congregation. Verse 16, it speaks about the whole con congregation. In other words, this looks like it's about the ecclesia, the whole ecclesia. In verse 17, it speaks about the ecclesia. In verse 18, it speaks about the ecclesia. In verse 20, it's speaking about the ecclesia. In verse 25, it's speaking about the descendants uh, that were a part of the ecclesia. In verse 30, it's speaking about the ecclesia, the congregation in every sense. At least in the King James Version, it says congregation. I'm not sure what it says in other versions. But the point here is that this, this disparity that, that was caused by an altar that looked wrong, looked like the wrong thing on the other side of the Jordan River, activated the judgment of the entire ecclesia, the entire congregation of Israel, all their tribes, and they band together and they came, gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against um, Reuben and, and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. So they make their case. They say, what have you done? This evil against the Lord. Don't you remember what happened at, at Peor? Well, this is Phineas talking. Phineas remembered what happened at Peor, and he was a bit awesome to have bring this up because Phineas was no small matter to deal with. Phineas was pretty serious, formidable, scary, if you want to put it that way. He was leading this confrontation. 
But they started with a discussion. They said, what have you done? And then Phineas even mentions um, the, the matter of fear, and he goes on to mention Achan. Don't you remember how all of Israel was to be held accountable to Achan, the one man's sin? Do you mean to do this to all of Israel? The Lord will have this against all of us if we allow you to hold this falsehood in your midst on the other side of the Jordan, the separation. This is a very serious issue over a separation that, that needed clarification. So as it goes on, they begin to make their defense. And they, they say, well, no, that, that's not what we meant to do. We in no way have espoused the, the uh, foreign god. In fact, when we made the altar, it was because we wanted our children to remember that we were still a part of you. This altar was meant to, to, to preserve the truth, not to, to, to let it go. This altar was a very important thing to us because we knew that one day our children would say, why are we separated from them? And if, if they, they didn't understand, if there was no, no witness to prove that we were still connected to the altars of Israel and the altar of the law of Moses, that we might be lost. So they made their defense, and as the story proceeds, uh, Phineas, they provided assurances, and Phineas accepted that. They were satisfied with their explanation. And if you read the last part of this, they implemented the reconciliation. Uh, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the priestess, in verse 32, he returned from the children of Reuben, from the children of Gad, and the land of Gilead, to the land of Canaan, and the children of Israel, and brought back word to them. So they made, uh, uh, they, they, they stated their case, there was a counter case and an explanation. There were assurances. Uh, war was averted and peace was established. And when it was in the decision to keep the peace, they went back and brought word to everyone else in Israel. So the thing pleased the children of Israel and the children of Israel blessed them and they spoke no more against them. The altar became a witness. So that's something like what the altar may have looked like. Let's take a look at what they did to reconcile. They gathered against their brethren on hearsay. But hearsay needs to be confirmed one way or another, doesn't it? They assembled to speak with them. They got together in an assembly and they spoke with each other. The assembly didn't just include two people as representatives. They included the last people. They tested their assumption. Their brethren answered, and as a, as a result of an honest answer that was in the same spirit as the one that they were in when they were trying to preserve uh, their relationship to Yahweh, they were trusted. Clarifications and mutual assurance were provided. They went home and spoke no more against them. They named the altar, witness between us. So what do we learn from that story? What had been an object of disparity was transformed into a, a witness of unity. It wouldn't just be something if we could create this transformation in our own reconciliation. Is there something in the sex of the process that act as a principle that we might understand would be helpful? to us in our considerations. The third story is the story of the king. The need to reconcile because they had long since uh, created a mess in the temple of God. Such a mess needed to be cleaned up and the doors were jammed. Once again, the door to the temple where the ingress and egress on the basis of faith occurs was they were broken had to be repaired. So if you look at, um, if I say verse 10 of chapter 29, let's go there. Sacrifices to the priests. But they came here and brought sacrifices and thank offerings and 
the house of the Lord. So the assembly brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, as many as were of a willing heart. And that's that's a throwback to something in, in or a throwback to something in the law that says when you offer the, the offering, do it with a willing heart. And so as many as had a willing heart were able to make this, this offering. We know from the story, as the story transpires, that not everyone had a willing heart. So they were left out. They didn't participate. They didn't come along. Even when Hezekiah sent his letters to all of Israel, those people who were not of a willing heart mocked, laughed and mocked them to scorn. And they never did participate. But there were many, many who did. So a distinction was made. A critical distinction is reconciliation between those who are of a willing heart and those who were not. Do we not have the same parameters? What we lack is a king and his authority. So, but so far we can take this particular reconciliation. What happened was, Hezekiah was 25, and he said, what about the temple? And I said, well, well, it's a long time. We don't even know what's going on over there. So he said, well, open the doors, fix them, clean it up, and let's restore the sacrifice. So he did. First for the priesthood, and then for everyone in Israel. Uh, the key points are, when they restored the sacrifice, they made an offering acknowledging their sin. They made a burnt offering acknowledging the sins of Israel on a collective sense, and they made an, a fellowship offering, finally, uh, with God in a peace offering. And this was, though, this was specifically those who had a willing heart, but it only took them eight days. The thing was done suddenly, it says. So it doesn't really have to take a long time to clean up a mess and fix it, if the approach is right. Uh, that's not been our experience. This is 100 years later, so I think we should give good thought to the fact that it only took them eight days. Uh, it's taken us 100 years, still not done. It only took us, as I said, 40 minutes. And we were just as astonished as they were that the thing was done so suddenly. So they resolved, once they understood how uh, their relationship with God was resolved in the sacrifice, they made a proclamation throughout all Israel. And they sent with it a letter and an invitation for everyone to come and participate with something that the priests had resolved in a more confined community. When they did this, they were laughed and mocked 